Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to be here again. Uh, I was here, I forget how long ago, a few months ago, uh, for a uh, poetry reading. It was a, it was a wonderful uh, occasion for me. The poems were mainly final poems, and some of them were translated for me into English, and then I was asked to, to read some poems. And I chose uh, three. I chose one from Yeats, uh, one from Michael Longley, and one from James Heaney. Um, and uh, that, that seems only a few months ago, so it's nice to see some of you again. And it's been a really entertaining um, afternoon for me listening to these very erudite uh, uh, examination of the links between Yeats and Antini and the, the very um, inspiring uh, uh, voices coming from Northern Ireland. I don't know how I can match that. But I thought I'd start off with one thing. Um, I think if Antini was here, he would be wondering whether to be in this room or outside uh, watching the cricket. And uh, it, it just made me, remind me of one of his poems which I found, I had this one with me. And this is about, uh, you know, the, the ones of you who want to be out there watching the cricket, uh, there's something in that, there's something in the playing and the game that is just so fascinating. And he was fascinated by that as well. So um, this one's called Markings. It comes from a, a volume called Seeing Things. And I was saying earlier how, uh, for the architects among us, and Ini was also very much interested in lines and in place and setting things out. So this, this, this is for both the architects and the, the sports people, the boys and girls who would like to be watching cricket. And this might, it might ring a bell to you anyway, it's called Marcus. He said, we marked the pitch, four jackets for four goalposts, that was all. The corners and the squares were there like longitude and latitude under the bumpy fisting ground to be agreed about or disagreed about from the time came. And then we picked the teams and crossed the line our own called names drew between us. Youngsters shouting their heads off in the field as the light died and they kept on playing. Because by then they were playing in their heads and the actual kick ball came to them like a dream heaviness and their own hard breathing in the dark and Skins of grass sounded like effort in another world. It was quick and constant, a game that never need be played out. Some limit had been passed. There was fitness, furtherance, untiredness. In time, there was extra, unforeseen, and free. So, he, did, as, as a young man, he played Gaelic football. And football in, 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 in Ireland, that's football with a ball up in the air. It's a great game, it's very fast, and he loved to play. And I think he gets across to you that feeling of, of wanting to be out there and playing with the ball, which I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of us uh, relate to. Um, interesting, lots of connections to th th this afternoon. Michael Longley, when I was uh, 11, 12 years old, which is a very impressionable age, uh, our English teacher was Michael Longley. Uh, and there, so I just was in school, and well, we heard our teacher called Michael Longley, and then the word went around, he's a bit of a poet, he writes poems. And we thought that was a little bit strange. We preferred football, but he was a bit of a poet, and one day he brought in a young friend of his to read poems to us. And he also did something else, which I just heard about Michael Longley. He would, instead of having a lesson of English, he would put on a record, and he would play us uh, there's some music and we had to think about what it made you think of. And the records, 1966-67, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Stop Back. Remember, Michael Longley played that to us. He also played Stravinsky. We had to listen to this classical music and, and, and think, write down what it made us think of. I, 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 I wasn't very good at that. But that was, that was Michael Longley, the poet, the great poet now. And the, young poet he brought into the room to read to us while she was in. Uh, so he came into my class one day and he read his poems. And I can't read them. <laughs> can't read them. But anyway, some of them are digging. And the one I was going to read is just too, it's too, as Catherine says, it's too close to my heart. The, the one called Follower. Look out for that one, Follower, about his father. It's a lovely poem. And he read one called Blackberry. Um, picking Blackberries. I don't think we have Blackberries here. Picking the, the blackberries in the wet Northern Ireland uh, rain, and, and, and then how the blackberries are picked, and then they go, they go moldy. A bit like I think also maybe the poem about frogs, I think maybe he read that one too. So those were some of the poems that he, he, he read to us. And so for me, 
Ine is a very personal poet. poet. Uh, and I, after that, I would follow his progress and I'd buy all the, all, the, all the thin volumes that came out every few years, I would buy them and read them. And anywhere where I've been around the world, I've always had these poems with me. And so when you're alone a long way from home, you pick up the poem and, you, and you're straight back in to, to Northern Ireland. So very, to me, a very personal poet. But I think also uh, the, the why Heaney is being recognized here is because he moved beyond that. He moved beyond Northern Ireland. He moved to, to say something more, to say something greater. And uh, Catherine was talking about the, the, the feeling of, of, of uh, concern we have. This afternoon I was invited to go and listen to one of the two main political parties, uh, talk to the diplomats and present us their views. But I've come here instead. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to say, but um, I've come here instead, and I think I'd, I'd rather to talk to some of the young people about some of the ways forward. And there was one, uh, I think that this, is, that this comes from much, much later, when indeed Catherine talked about the troubles we had in Northern Ireland. And the and 66, that, that time with Longley and Heaney when I was only 12 years old, that was a sort of golden age. There's a book called Golden Age. Bangladesh, isn't there? It's the golden age before the troubles. And then the troubles really started in 68, 69, and then Heaney was asked to take position, and indeed he was, he was cautious about how he was, uh, what position he took there. And, uh, but at the time of what, what something we, we never expected, I never expected there to be a, a peace, to be a solution to the problem. I really thought going through the early 70s that there was no way out of this. Two parties, two clans, with different colors fighting and fighting and, and, and fighting the battles of the past rather than looking forward. And I thought there was no hope here. But strangely, I don't know where it came from, strangely there was some hope and things did come together and a lot of pressure, a lot of money uh, came in and, and, and we reached an agreement in, in order. I wasn't there but I, I saw it from and it was, it was as astonishing that agreement as, as it was to see the unification of Europe, the fall of the Berlin Wall, things like that, really you wouldn't think that would happen, and yet they did. And yet they did, and it was peace in Northern Ireland. And he wrote this poem, um, this is an excerpt from it um, at the time, uh, which I think talks about Northern Ireland and it goes wider. And so I wanted to read this one to you as an excerpt from The Cure of Troy by Seamus Heaney. Human beings suffer. They torture one another, they get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can truly write a wrong inflicted or endured. The innocent in jails beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. The police widow in veils thinks at the funeral home. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. Then once in a lifetime, the long for tidal wave of justice rises up, and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Belief in a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. Call the miracle self-healing, the utter self-revealing, double take of feeling. If there's fire on the mountain, or lightning and storm, and the God speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry of the birth cry of new life at its term. It means, once in a lifetime, that justice can rise up and hope of history rise. So that was Heaney's hope of something he wrote there, and I think you understand what that means. And then the last one I wanted to read to you is a little bit how I feel that Heaney goes beyond even further than that uh, to something further, something more and more universal. Um, but I can't read the one. The last time I was looking for a poem that I thought everybody would understand and I read the kites because looking through the poem sometimes you think it's too, it's, you have to read it several times to get the sense. But with that poem, the kite, I think you've got it. It's a simple, it's a simple poem. And it was one of his last ones, and I think it was the last one published. And I read it then. But I didn't realize what it meant. So you read it again, go to it again, and read that poem again. The last lines say something about the end of his life. 
and I think he was, he was the victim. But the one poem, there were lots of tributes that came out uh, in the press after he died, uh, and uh, some of them were very well written, some I thought weren't so well written, but the Financial Times chose a poem, which I suddenly remembered, and I just love this poem, and it's called Postscript. And uh, in this poem, you can hear echoes of uh, Wordsworth, of the daffodils, that moment, that moment when he sees the daffodils, and you, know, you hear that moment. And there's also echoes of Yeats, of the wild swans of Cool, which I read one day, that wonderful moment where he sees 950 swans. And it's, it's in there, but it's just, it's just how there are moments, there are moments in life, sometimes a picture that just takes your breath away. Just a moment. It might be a glorious six. It just might be that moment. If you were hitting it, it might be that glorious moment that takes your breath away. That's why the, that's why we shout. Or it might be a poem that you hear that just speaks to you. Uh, it might be a picture. Suddenly you see a picture by Picasso or by uh, the, the great Aberdeen, the great uh, uh, the, the great the great uh, painter whose work we were recently looking at. Those 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 pictures of the starvation. Just some something takes your breath away. And this is a simple one, but a simple everyday one. And I think this is where he takes the everyday simple thing and, and adds the dimension to it. He's just driving out in a car in the Irish countryside. And he sees something that takes his breath away, that's all. So can I get through it? Big breath. Deep breath. Postscript. And sometime make the time to drive out west into County Clare along the flaggy shore in September or October, when the wind and the light are working off each other so that the ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter, and inland, among stones, the surface of a slick grey lake is lit by the earth lightning of a flock of swans. Their feathers rough and ruffling white on white their fully grown, headstrong looking heads tucked or cresting or busy underwater. Useless to think you'll park or capture it more thoroughly. You are neither here nor there. A hurry through which known and strange things pass as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways and catch the heart off guard and blow it open. 